This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. Uh, I'm Vikram Chandra, welcome. It is my pleasure today to introduce Daniel Alarcon, who is the editor of the award-wearing Peruvian journal Etiqueta Negra, and is currently a visiting scholar at the Center for Latin American Studies at UC Berkeley, and he lives nearby in Oakland. Uh, Daniel was born in Lima, but grew up in Birmingham, Alabama. After finishing an undergraduate degree at Columbia University, he received an MFA from the Iowa Writers Workshop. Daniel's first book, a collection of short stories titled War by Candlelight, was published in 2005, um, and I should say to, to universal acclaim. These stories move easily from Manhattan to the war-scarred countryside and cities of Peru. The characters in them are dizzied by the currents of globalization and scarred by violence and inured to it. In a story called Flood, one character asks another to tell a joke. The other replies, listen, Two stories downtown, two soldiers downtown. Almost midnight, a few minutes before curfew, and they see a man hurrying home. The first soldier checks his watch. He's got five minutes, he says. The second soldier raises his gun and shoots the man dead. Why do you shoot him, the first soldier says. He has five minutes. He lives on my street, the other one says. He won't make it in time. <laughs> a grim joke and a revealing one. The stories in War by Candlelight unflinchingly witness the ravages of nature and poverty, of violence and its aftermath, and celebrate the courage of the survivors. Publishers Weekly wrote, Alarcon's voice is fierce and assured. This voice found a new fullness in Daniel's next book, the novel Lost City Radio. This story is set in an unnamed South American city in an unnamed country, but both city and landscape are brought alive in such vivid, specific detail that they feel as real as the room that we're sitting in right now. There has been a civil war in this country between um, the usual nation state government versus insurgents, but the war is over and those now in control want to forget that it ever happened. Villages have been stripped of their names and are now referred to only by numbers. But the people of this country cannot forget because their lost ones are still with them. Thousands of people have been disappeared and thousands more have vanished into the migrations caused by the troubles. The protagonist of Lost City Radio, Norma, is a national radio star. Every week on the radio, she reads the names of those who have gone missing in the hope that someone will come forward with information. Perhaps a family will find a son or daughter or at least an explanation. The entire country listens, especially the poor and the ones who live out in the villages in the jungles. Norma's husband is one of the missing, and so she's also one of those left with a void in her life. At one point in the book, she thinks, people disappear, they vanish, and with them, the history, so that new myths replace the old. The war never happened at all. It was just a dream. But then, years later, a tiny echo of those missing. Do you ignore it? The extraordinary achievement of this book is that it refuses to let us ignore these echoes. It brings to life the profound and lasting effects of war, the transformations that violence visits on communities, and the wounds that human beings carry forever. What I especially liked about it, that there are no good guys and bad guys here, and that nobody escapes the desolation that war leaves behind. In 2007, Lost City Radio was included in lists of best books of the year, by the Washington Post, the LA Times, and many others. Um, Daniels won many other awards, honors, and fellowships, but I don't want to take up too much time listing them. So with no further ado, Daniel Alarcon. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I want to thank the, the library for inviting me and, and Vikram for that kind introduction. Um, I'm, uh, I've, I've been, uh, I'm sort of done reading from Lost City Radio. Um, and I, I, I've been working for the last couple of months on a, on a long piece of nonfiction 
about the book piracy industry in Peru. Um, if anyone's been to Peru, you've seen it. Uh, and if you've been to any kind of developing country anywhere in the world, you've probably seen it as well. I'm going to read um, and then do a slideshow and then uh, pass around pirated copies of my own book, which I purchased on the streets of Lima. Um, and then uh, I really want to sort of have a discussion because I, I spent two months investigating this and then another month and a half writing it. So there's really more information than I could possibly fit in, a, you know, in, a, in any piece that anyone would care to publish. Um, and I actually found it a lot more fascinating than I, than I thought I would find it. So uh, this is from a piece called Life Among the Pirates. In March of this year, Rodrigo Rosales, the director of the Peruvian offices of the international publisher Planeta, got an urgent call from Madrid. Paulo Coelho's people were upset. It seems the Brazilian writer's latest novel, O Vencedor Está So, published in English as The Winner Stands Alone, had been seen on the streets of Lima in an unauthorized edition. Rosales was taken aback. Coelho is a steady bestseller in Peru and everywhere, and any new title by him is certain to be pirated almost immediately upon publica publication. But this one wasn't scheduled to be released until July. In fact, it hadn't even officially been translated into Spanish. Though piracy exists all over Latin America and the developing world, any editor with international experience in the region will tell you that Peru's problem is both unique and profound. According to the International Intellectual Property Alliance, the local publishing industry loses more money to piracy than any other South American country, with the exception of Brazil, whose economy is more than eight times the size of Peru's. A 2005 report commissioned by the Camara Peruana del Libro, the CPL, a national consortium of publishing houses, distributors, and booksellers, came to an even more alarming conclusion. Pirates were employing more people than formal publishers and booksellers, and their combined economic impact was estimated to be $52 million, or roughly equivalent to 100% of the legal industry's total earnings. The pirates operate in plain sight. Vendors ply the streets of the capital, carrying heavy stacks of books as they drift through stop traffic or spreading a torn piece of blue plastic tarp on a sidewalk, laying their wares out hopefully for all to see. You can find them in front of high schools, institutes, and government buildings, or wandering the aisles of the markets where most limeños do their shopping. One Saturday, I came across a man selling pirated law texts, cloth-bound, official-looking copies, so well-made I had a hard time believing they were fake, who told me that on weekdays he rented a stand at a local university inside the law school, where presumably Peru's future lawyers are taught about copyright law, intellectual property, and other fantastical and irrelevant concepts. On summer weekends, these salesmen work the beaches south of the city or congregate at the toll booths on the way out of town. On the margins of this business are the thieves, bands of skilled shoplifters who specialize in stealing books, trolling all the major fairs, hitting all the official bookstores, and supplying a vibrant resale market with their so-called libros de bajada. Then there are the pirates themselves, the informal book manufacturers whose overworked antique presses are hidden in nondescript houses and slums all over the city the larger of these operations can crank out some 40,000 volumes a week. And because of their superior distribution, the pirates can sell three times as many copies of a book as an authorized publisher can. For a bestseller like Coelho, the figure could be even higher. It didn't take Rosales long to confirm the story. He went out to, he went out to look for Coelho's unpublished book and found it at the first major intersection. Something had to be done. Peruvian book pirates are among the world's quickest and most entrepreneurial, some would say most treacherous, a reality Coelho and his handlers were well aware of. At the start of this decade, the pirates had nearly killed the Peruvian publishing industry. Its survival and subsequent resurgence is seen by many as something of a miracle. Counterfeit books printed in Lima have been known to show up in Quito, Ecuador, in La Paz, Bolivia, in the towns of northern Chile as far east as Buenos Aires, Argentina. This same Coelho edition, if it were to be imported, could conceivably nullify the sizable investment Rosales' house had made to publish the novel in the Spanish-speaking world. Coelho's people demanded action. And so began the latest skirmish in the on-again, off-again battle against Peruvian book piracy. The CPL registered a formal complaint, an investigation began, and a few months later, on June 23rd, after failing to find the presses where Coelho's book was being printed, the CPL helped organize a police raid on the points of sale instead. The chosen site was the Consorcio Grau, a market on the busy avenue in central Lima notorious for its counterfeit merchandise. The operation seized a million soles, $330,000 U.S., worth of pirated books, some, some 90,000 volumes in all. 
All the major networks covered the story, though few noted the fact that within 24 hours, the stands were open again and fully restocked. Perhaps this wasn't news. Book pirates, like drug traffickers, always assume that a certain percentage of their merchandise will not make it to market. These losses are budgeted for, part of the accepted cost of doing business. But there was still one more surprise. In July, when Planeta finally published the official version of Coelho's novel in Peru, Rosales decided to compare the two texts. He went line by line, page by page, and discovered that the translations were essentially the same. The Peruvian book pirates hadn't commissioned their own translation as Rosales had previously assumed. Instead, they had infiltrated Planeta in Spain and stolen the official translation before it was complete. New books in Peru, new legally produced books that is, are often sold bearing a sticker that reads, buy original. Just one of the small ways the publishing industry has responded to the threat from book pirates. The fact is though, being pirated is the Peruvian equivalent of making the bestseller list. One writer I know ends all his reading by, readings by urging those in attendance to quote, buy my book before it gets pirated. When I asked him about it, he confessed that he hadn't actually been pirated yet, but he hoped he would be soon. <laughs> The award-winning novelist Alonso Cueto told me he receives unsolicited sales reports from the man who sells pirate novels in his neighborhood. At first, this made him angry, but by now Cueto has learned to tolerate it. Less tolerable, he said, is that the same vendor feels authorized to give the writer advice on potential subject matter that might be more commercially successful. <laughs> Pirates reach sectors of the book market that formal publishers cannot or don't care to access. Outside Lima, the pirate book industry is the only one that matters. Oscar Colchado Lucio, one of a handful of Peruvian writers who actually make a living from their book sales, told me the time he'd gone to the town of Huancayo to do a reading at a very, very poor school. He signed some 300 books without coming across a single original. The authorized version simply wasn't available. There were no bookstores in Huancayo. One novelist who preferred not to be named for fear of being sued was disappointed that his novel wasn't available in his provincial hometown. In response, he contacted a pirate in Lima, made a deal, and soon his book was for sale all over the country. When I asked him about it, he made no apology. If someone can produce for $3 what the editor is selling for 20 then I think perhaps the editor is a terrible businessman, he said. In a few cases, pirates have rescued the work of, by writers the formal industry has forgotten. A friend told me the story of Luis Hernandez, a little-known avant-garde poet with a cult following among university students. Photocopied versions of his out-of-print collections have been passed around for years, but no publisher had bothered to reissue the work until a vendor from downtown Lima recognized the need, partnered with a press, and came out with his own unauthorized edition. I remember writing to lunch in 2007, around the time my first novel was published, with Tittinger, a friend of mine who also had a new book in stores. We worked at the same magazine, and Uber, the owner, our boss, had offered to take us out to celebrate. Along the way, we came to the traffic light at an intersection that doubled as a marketplace, where vendors sold fruit and dry erase boards and newspapers and inflatable children's toys. It's a scene repeated on hundreds, perhaps thousands of street corners in the Peruvian capital, an image familiar to anyone who has lived or traveled in Latin America or anywhere in the developing world. There were booksellers, too. Naturally, an Uber called one over. The salesman was heavy set and awkward, moving clumsily between the cars, and carried his books before him like a shield, the covers facing outward. Self-help titles, mostly. It was the season of the Peruvian edition of Who Moved My Cheese, I recall. <laughs> books about local scandals and worldwide bestsellers like El Código Da Vinci. Anything by Alarcón or Tichinger? Hubert asked. The man frowned. Who? And that was all. Uberth rolled up his window. You're both failures, he said, turning to us. <laughs> my first collection has, to my knowledge, never been pirated, which is something of a disappointment. The day of our lunch with Uberth, my novel had just gone on sale and was retailing for about 50 soles, the equivalent of 18 US dollars. This is nearly the same price it might fetch in an American bookstore, with one crucial difference. In Peru, that figure represents about 20% of the average worker's weekly income. I was frankly embarrassed by the price. How could I, in good conscience, expect my friends and family to pay that much for a book? Except for the small, middle, and upper classes, who has that kind of disposable income? A few weeks later, I was doing a reading at the library of one of Lima's prisons. I brought a copy of my novel along to donate to the collection, but to my surprise, the inmates already had one. They were rather embarrassed about it, but eventually they agreed to show it to me. The cover looked a lot like the original, except that the title had been rendered in incongruously playful red bubble letters with white trim. 
It was printed on cheap white office paper, and the photo photocopying wasn't particularly well done. Every few pages, a stray hair floated over the text, and some pages had been copied at an angle so that my sentences slid toward the outside margin at a melancholy slant. One of the inmates explained that he had received my book as a gift from the outside. He claimed he hadn't known it was pirated. I nodded as if I believed him. Could you sign it, the prison librarian asked me, and I did, of course, leaving the prison that day feeling as if I'd accomplished something. If there is a certain allure to book piracy, it is only because we imbue this business with the same qualities we project onto the book itself. We focus on what is being manufactured and sold as opposed to the fundamentally illicit nature of the enterprise. There are many reasons for this, of course. As a cultural artifact, the book has undeniable power, and the idea of a poor, developing country with a robust, informal publishing industry is, on some level, romantic. The pirate as cultural entrepreneur, a Robin Hood figure, stealing from, the, from elitist multinational publishers and taking books to the people. The myth is seductive and repeated often. Book piracy in Peru, the story goes, responds to a hunger for knowledge in a country that throughout its history has been violently divided between a literate upper class and the poor, unlettered masses. Literacy grew dramatically through the last century. Nearly 60% of Peruvians were illiterate in 1940, compared with only 7% in 2007. And along with this progress came a desire for books and all they represent. Still, millions of rural Peruvians are monolingual speakers of indigenous languages and remain politically and economically marginalized as a result in a country divided by race, ethnicity, and language, acquiring fluency and literacy in Spanish has often been seen as an important first step towards socioeconomic advancement. Original books remain a prohibitively expensive luxury item out of reach for most of the population. There are vast swaths of the country with no formal bookstores. Iquitos, the largest city in the Peruvian Amazon with nearly 400,000 residents, has only two and had none as recently as 2007. Trujillo, the country's third largest city, has only one. School libraries, if they exist at all, are usually nothing more than a few dozen moldering titles of little literary or historical value. More often than not, the only significant collections are housed at private universities where neither students nor faculty are permitted to roam the stacks where checkout privileges are limited to 24 hours. That is, just long enough to photocopy or pirate a book and return it. Nor is this bleak situation confined to the rural areas or the provinces. An estimated 85 to 90 percent of books are sold in the Lima metropolitan area, but for a city of nearly 9 million, there are relatively few formal bookstores, the majority concentrated in the upper middle class districts of San Isidro or Miraflores. North Lima, for example, comprising eight districts of the Peruvian capital, home to roughly 2 million inhabitants and half the city's middle class, has none. The wealthiest of these eight districts, Los Olivos, has a municipal library boasting a rather meager assortment of only 1,500 donated volumes, including, naturally, a few counterfeit editions. For some 30 years, the National Library of Peru had no acquisitions budget and also had to rely on donations to build its collection. Given this context, is it any wonder books are pirated? You can lament the informality of it, you can call it stealing, you can bemoan the losses incurred by the publishing industry, but if you love to read, it's difficult to deny the hopeful logic. If someone is selling books, someone must be buying them, and if someone's buying them, someone must be reading them, and reading, especially in a country as poor as Peru, isn't that a good thing? Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna pause there. Um, what I did, I ended up speaking with a guy named Herman Coronado, who is a, a publisher of a, of a publishing house called Pesa. Pesa is one of the last independent publishing houses in Peru. And, um, and Coronado is, uh, is an interesting character because uh, he's, he's sort of the guy who, who went after the, the pirates in the, in the 90s. And he has an interesting thesis. This is a guy who should be pretty rich. He was the publisher of Alfredo Bryce Echenique and Mario Vargas Llosa, uh, the two, Peru's two best-selling novelists. He's not rich at all. He looks like, like he got hit by a truck, you know, kind of has this deathly pale pallor to him. I mean, I, I did catch him like right before the book fair, so he was a little crazed. Um, but so generally he blames uh, Fujimori. And his, his thesis is this, that, uh, you know, throughout the, the total chaos of the 1980s, um, there was uh, the informal economy just took off, you know, because the, the regular economy just simply wasn't functioning. So everything became informal. And then in the 90s, when Fujimori comes and opens up the economy again, um, there's all these press, presses imported. 
and those presses, Fujimori was using them to control the, 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 the newspapers, uh, specifically the cheap uh, periodicos chicha, which is like the cheap uh, kind of broadsheet, the yellow journalism, real, real uh, crappy stuff, that he, they were literally dictating and controlling this press. Um, so according to Coronado, these same presses were used to to, uh, to print up counterfeit books. But specifically, there was, there was also uh, uh, an issue of, of a vendetta against Mario Vargas Llosa, who after 92 basically stood up and became um, Fujimori's main political rival, like the one person with international cachet who could say Fujimori's a dictator. And Vargas Llosa, to his credit, did do this and, uh, and paid a heavy price for it. So for example, um, by 2000, when, uh, when uh, Mario Vargas Llosa's novel, The Feast of the Goat, was published um, with like a, a hologram and everything so that it could not be copied. And uh, it appeared the same day on the streets with the same hologram. And there was eventually seven different unauthorized versions of this novel. Um, to under I mean, it, it's impossible really to understand how important Mario Vargas Llosa is to, to in Peru. I mean, he, he says something about anything. You know, he's like, says something about the weather and it's like in the newspaper. He's a very, very important figure. And in, in the 90s, especially in the pol pol politically, after he'd run for president and lost to Fujimori, he was the one person who was sort of had this, this, uh, this position from which to, to criticize the government. So Coronado's thesis is that it became sort of an attack. Piracy became a way to, to destroy the intellectual class, uh, rob them of their of their, uh, their economic sort of viability. Um, and also just a function of a general deterioration of uh, f formality in every respect. Um, and so I, I was talking to him and I, and I sort of brought up the idea of, uh, you know, this kind of romantic notion of, of pirated books, you know, being for the masses and sort of like bringing the price down so people can reach them. And he pointed out something, you know, which is obvious once you spend time in Lima. He said, those people, uh, the most, you know, most of the, pirate, the people that are selling pirated books are in the same neighborhoods where you find the bookstores. So who are they selling books to? They're selling books to middle class people. The same people, and he has this great quote where he says, you know, the same people who would never ever buy a counterfeit whiskey think nothing of buying a counterfeit book. Um, and he, he was really one of the most pessimistic people I've ever spoken to for, for any long period of time because he, he, he basically described it and uh, uh, diagnosed it as a, as a cultural illness um, where there's no respect for intellectual property, there's no respect for intellectual creation, um, and, uh, and the people who should respect it, the people who have money, people who are middle class, who have sort of quote unquote middle class values, have no respect for it at all. Um, Throughout the 90s, they filed something like 250 lawsuits trying to, uh, to put these people out of business. The guy became obsessed and uh, was head of the Camara Perona Libro for a while and um, just was on, on a rampage, you know, and he, would, he filed like 250 lawsuits. He, you know, would give the police detailed lists with addresses and names and photos and physical descriptions, uh, locations of presses, points of sale. Nothing happened. There's no one in jail currently or ever, really. Um, for um, for book piracy, so um, it was a, a really illuminating conversation and uh, and uh, you know totally de depressing in fact, um, but I would just sort of wanted to summarize that section. His enemies are uh, or, or I guess his uh, his primary targets are a group of booksellers that are now at a place called Amazonas, uh, not to be confused with Amazon.com, but Amazonas is a is a is a place in downtown Lima, um, and so he uh, he hates these people, like hates them, like like I, I don't know, I, like like Cal hates Stanford or something, um, or more than that. That's totally playing to the home crowd, huh? Um, he 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 really like froths at the mouth when he starts talking about them. Um, so I I, uh, I I I paid a visit to to Amazonas. This is what I wrote. The book market commonly known as Amazonas is a few blocks east of Abancay, one of the main avenues that leads to Lima's old city center. It sits on a sliver of land on the southern bank of the Rimac, a murky, polluted river that neatly divides the capital into north and south. The wall on the far bank is decorated with a mural, a painting of green hills, bright blue skies, and palm trees, a verdant, inviting scene that contrasts starkly with the actual view, a dusty, monochrome slum beneath a hill hidden in fog. 
At Amazonas, you will find more than 200 vendors of used, antiquarian, and pirated books, most of whom have known each other for 20 years. They formed a loose cooperative in the 1980s when 30 or 40 booksellers began congregating in the median of a downtown avenue called Grau. They sold secondhand books, were inoffensive, and not particularly prosperous. In those days, the old center of Lima had been overrun by informal commerce, an unsightly byproduct of the social disarray and economic turmoil. The stately colonial era buildings, once the pride of patrician Lima, had been taken over by merchants and transformed into dense black market labyrinths. Trade spilled outdoors, over the sidewalks, and into the streets. In some areas, six lanes of traffic had been reduced to one in each direction, the rest given over to the informal economy. These vendors are known as ambulantes, which literally means wandering or itinerant, but they had become a permanent part of the urban landscape. When they were finally moved from the major avenues, it was discovered that some carts had been there so long their owners had affixed them with metal plates and screws to the very sidewalk. In the case of the Grau booksellers, the long-term urban plan of the city included an expansion of the avenue, which 11 years later is only now underway. And finally, in 1998, then-Mayor Alberto Andrade convinced, that the booksellers, convinced the booksellers to relocate to an empty lot along the Giron Amazonas. They were joined by 150 or so book vendors scattered throughout downtown and formed what is now known as the Camara Popular de Libros, which, not coincidentally, coincidentally, also goes by the acronym CPL, like its official rival, the Camara. You can find almost any book or magazine at Amazonas, provided you are willing to wander its aisles and search amid the stacks of volumes spread on wobbly tables or crammed into rusty metal bookshelves. There are many original books, but counterfeits aren't hard to find. If you don't see what you want right away, just ask for the Peruvian edition or a more economical version, and most booksellers will get the hint. Alongside books, some vendors have begun selling grade school science projects, styrofoam monstrosities representing the water cycle, the greenhouse effect, or the vascular system. While you look for, say, a readable edition of Victor Hugo's Les Miserables, you might see a young woman behind a counter, hard at work on a diorama of Machu Picchu, a look of grave concentration on her face as she glues a plastic yama to a green spray-painted mountainside. These projects sell for 20 soles, less than $7 US, a price which includes a lesson on the topic so the student can be prepared to present his or her science project in class. <laughs> Some might consider this cheating, but all the students I spoke to said it was their teachers who had sent them there. <laughs> Science projects are a lucrative but relatively new product at Amazonas and a controversial one. For more than a decade, Amazonas has been synonymous with books, and some vendors told me they were concerned about diluting the brand with these school projects. To be sure, books still make up the bulk of what is sold, secondhand, stolen originals, counterfeits, along with the sorts of oddities a, cultural of piracy, a culture of piracy will inevitably produce. An unauthorized edition of Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment, for example, its cover emblazoned with a drawing of a revolver, smoke rising from its barrel. <laughs> or a 100-page abridged version of a much longer Bryce Chenique novel, a few chapters excised arbitrarily to save printing cost. It was Bryce himself who told me he'd once seen a pirated edition of La Palabra del Mudo, literally the word of the mute, though it sounds much better in Spanish. This is a famous story collection by Peruvian writer Julio Ramon Ribeiro, now out of print because of a dispute with the author's estate. The pirates had made one important alteration to maximize sales. Instead of Ribeiro, they printed Mario Vargas Llosa's name on the cover. <laughs> one morning, I met with a man I'll call Jacinto in a drab, gray restaurant across the Amazonas market. We were served coffee, watered down and steamy before we'd even ordered it. Jacinto was clearly a regular. He's in his late 40s, with a wide, squarish face and graying, spiky hair. He didn't want to be seen with me at Amazonas. The other booksellers were, by nature, suspicious people, and it was best not to appear too friendly with strangers. Though it's not necessarily obvious, some of the booksellers at Amazonas are very wealthy. They might own three or four stands there, a few more scattered around central Lima, and somewhere in the city's endless outer districts, a press. It's often a family operation, and they might have a relative in the provinces who travels selling books at local fairs. They earn thousands of dollars a month and are careful to protect their investments from nosy outsiders. When Jacinto was a boy, only rich people had books. Though his father loved to read, the family never owned more than a handful of old volumes. They lived in the provinces in a jungle town called Pucallpa, 500 miles from Lima, and buying a single new book would have required saving money for a year or more. 
There was no piracy in those days. Books were printed in Lima or imported, which, if you lived in the jungle, amounted to the same thing. Jacinto had inherited his father's love of reading and was a good student, was a good enough student to be able to study sociology at Federico Villarreal, a public university in Lima. It was the 1980s, and he got caught up in the radical politics of the time. He didn't tell me much in the way of details, but then he didn't have to. It's a common enough tale for a man his age in Peru. In the 1980s, Jacinto left the country for a while. He had to leave, I gathered, crossed into the US illegally, and spent a few years pumping gas in the Bronx, painting houses in Jersey. He returned to Peru in the early 1990s, but two years later, after Fujimori's coup, he had no choice but to flee again. He spent some time in Los Angeles, a place about which he had remarkably little to say. He made friends with Mexicans. He rode the bus a lot. It was not a very happy time. In 2000, he came back to Peru for good and took over his uncle's stand at Amazonas. Working with books was a dream, Jacinto said. He had fond memories of shopping for secondhand books in his student days before Amazonas when the business was still concentrated on the median of Grau, and now he was the one doing the selling. After all he'd been through, he considered himself lucky. Being a reader made him something of a rarity among booksellers at Amazonas. To most, it was just a way to make money, whereas to Jacinto, books meant something. Homer, Magellan, Marx, these men had changed his life with their writings. There were only a few vendors who really knew anything about what they sold. Jacinto could count them on his fingers. He said, the rest were poor, barely literate men and women who'd come from the provinces fleeing the violence. They could be selling books or anything. Books had no special value to them, which is why piracy came so naturally. Jacinto claimed he never participated in piracy. It was, an, it was excessive courtesy that kept me from pressing him on it, or perhaps his statement was so transparently untrue there was no need. By his own admission, he'd done well, earned a decent living, even managed to buy an apartment and a car. Things had changed since the days of Grau, when people sold dusty old books and struggled to get by. He agreed with Coronado's thesis. The Fujimori years had been the golden age. Everyone knew it, but there were still people making money. Jacinto cultivated high-end clientele. He sold books to well-known critics, to academics and intellectuals, his steady customers, and enjoyed the conversations he sometimes had with these people. But it was a sordid world, and there were snakes all around him. He told me of being robbed in the streets around Amazonas and having to pay petty ransoms to get his merchandise back from the stick-up kids. There was, they were always disappointed when the bags they stole happened to be filled with books. They were high all the time and couldn't read anyway. Even if you explained that there was money to be made, they'd never believe it. And the pirates, I asked. If anyone seemed to have figured out this basic truth, it was the counterfeiters. Jacinto nodded. Do you watch gangster movies, he said? Have you seen Carlito's Way? Sure, I said. That's what the pirates have understood. I asked him to explain. Jacinto's hometown, Pucallpa, is where Peru's first generation of successful and notorious drug traffickers came of age. He claimed to have known some of these men, to have watched them and their businesses grow. He learned a few things that applied to his own line of work, most significantly this. Illicit enterprises don't get big without the cooperation of the authorities. That's how it had happened with the future drug dealers, the men of Jacinto's generation who made their fortunes in the cocaine boom of the 1980s. According to Jacinto, the pirates had first come to dominate Amazonas, then all of Lima, because they ran their businesses according to the same ruthless codes that any criminal organization might employ. They protected their territory and competed viciously with one another to get their products out as quickly as possible at the lowest price. They paid cops to look the other way. They bought off judges. In the days after a raid, police officers would show up at Amazonas selling seized books on the low. Jacinto had seen it himself. Books are wonderful. Books are beautiful, he said. It was a privilege to come to work every day and be surrounded by the written word. He had some volumes of inestimable value, books that he'd never sell because they were so special to him. But he wanted me to be clear about one thing. In the underworld of booksellers, it was business first. If one illegal press were brought down, two would take its place. And as long as there was money to be made, the pirates would never disappear. I'm going to uh, pause there, and I, I want to sort of run through this, uh, this slideshow. So um, I work for this magazine, Etiqueta Negra, and uh, our staff photographer, Claudia Alva, uh, we sent her out to take some photos. Um, and uh, so these, these are just a, a few of them. I, I do want to point out, when these pictures were taken, the book on the bottom, this book right here, had come out like two days before these photos were taken. Um, 
so there's some titles here you can recognize the Dan Brown book. Uh, that yellow one is Who Moved My Cheese, which apparently still is in style. Uh, uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, which I've seen in the United States. A bunch of American books, and also this really funny book called Mierda, Llegué a los 50, which means I made it to 50. Uh, <laughs> this is the same guy. He took his hat off for this second shot. Uh, this is outside the, uh, at the, the, the pedestrian overpass in front of the National University of Engineering. Um, as you can see, a little bit of... of uh, the, the, the thing that's crazy about it, I mean, books appear so quickly, and, and some of these books are, are, you know, poor translations of, you know, kind of throwaway books anyway. Um, but occasionally you'll come across books, uh, I mean, it's all over downtown Lima. Um, so that, that in that one way, what Coronado said isn't exactly true, because you can, you know, they are selling a lot in downtown Lima, which isn't exactly the, the most posh part of town. Uh, but occasionally you'll come across, I'll come across friends, but, uh, books by friends of mine, books that I know they like nearly died trying to, to finish, like, you know, really intense novels, and, and they're selling for like $3. This is the entrance to, um, to uh, the place that's commonly known as Amazonas. Uh, it says there, the, the paradise of books, El Paraíso de los Libros. Um, I, was, I just thought it was so funny that they, the name they picked was basically a pirated version of the official uh, Peruvian chamber of books, the Camara Peruana de Libros. They totally just copied it. Um, here's a, a, a bookseller reading the paper. I had this funny situation happen where I went, you know, of course, I went to, to, to Grau to go look for my book. Um, and I uh, just wanted to sort of see what it looked, what impunity looks like, basically. Um, because this place had been raided in the middle of the night, this like commando mission with like lots of cops and everything. And, and I went and, you know, everything was totally back to normal. They were just delivering books the whole time I was there. Um, and I had this funny situation where I, I saw my book, you know, and I. Actually, I should pass these around. Um, here. So the one with the blue sticker is, is the original. The one that looks crappy is the pirated version. <laughs> or maybe just try to figure it out. It shouldn't be that hard. The one in, in plastic is real. So I saw my book, the, the, that, the, the one with the blue title, and I pulled it down, and I was looking at it. And I just was like, oh, man, this is crazy. And I put it back, and it's, the woman there was smoking a cigarette, and she just totally snapped at me. She's like, that's not where it was. <laughs> It's like, I wrote this. What are you talking about? Uh, it was really, really funny. Um, so there's something that, that I, you know, when the, the book fair happens in Peru at the end of July, and when that happens, um, it's, it, it's something that I think would be hard to imagine here, but it's a major cultural event. So for weeks before and after, tons of press, interviews with writers everywhere, photos of writers, um, and the, the, the book fair itself um, is... is a really democratic affair. It's held over the and the kind of the the national holidays, so a lot of the rich people from Lima leave, and the people and it's very cheap to get in. So the people that go are students and working class people and people who will buy one book a year, but they'll buy it there and they'll just go every day and just sit through anything. And uh, it's it's really dumb. you know people have will just. I, one time I was in the bathroom at the urinal and this kid tapped me on the shoulder and was like, "Hey, will you read my novel?" You know, there's no distance between writers and public, you know, uh, there, there, none at all, which is kind of awesome, but also just kind of crazy. Um, and it, books are, are very, very, very respected. Um, but so it also happens that this, I was writing this piece and investigating this piece right during the book fair, and, uh, and so I went to go ask for my book, and, uh, and, I, and I was like, hey, do you have anything by that new book by Alarcón? And this guy was doing a crossword puzzle, and my photo was on the back of the newspaper. And he's like, aren't you Alarcón? And I was like, ah, yeah. <laughs> And then he just kind of shrugged like it was totally, like, like writers often came to ask for their books at Grau. And he was like, yeah, I'll have it next week. <laughs> so this is, uh, this is inside Amazonas. You can see it just goes on forever. Um, and uh, uh, th these are the science projects that I was describing. So that's a, a map of Peru. Uh, and I actually heard a guy, uh, uh, you know, he was, he, was, uh, he was selling his project, with, you know, his crazy, like, water table business. Um, he was like, I'm selling this for 25, and he's giving the speech to, to a, a mother, a father, and their son. And he says, you know, um, I know you can get the same thing down there for 20, but I was a public school teacher for 20 years, so I can teach your kid how to present this better. That one down there, he can't even read. <laughs> 
So uh, Amanecer, this, this black book right there, uh, I feel like that's one of those, uh, those uh, vampire books that sells a lot. Um, let's see. Uh, so they, they uh, Isabel Allende here, uh, another, a bunch of the vampire novels. Uh, Alonso Cueto's novel there, the, the writer I mentioned. Um, John Grisham, yeah. And that's that Petro Alios book again. That's some book on Bill Clinton. Um, and these are the Paulo Coelho books that supposedly they were raiding and trying to get rid of. Um, impossible, impossible to get rid of. And this is a, another one that says that by original. Um, and this is the, the beginning. Um, th the issue of this being cultural, I, I just want to read the this one section. Uh, well, no, I, I, let, me, let me explain one, one thing quickly. I went to meet with the, a guy named Raul Villavicencio who was the, the lawyer for the CPL. And, uh, and so basically I was like, you know, tell me the backstory of this, this raid. And uh, he, was like, he, uh, he was like, well, you know, the raids, are, that's how we're going to bring down the pirates. And he's like, well, so why don't you do them every, every week? He's like, well, it's kind of hard, you know. I was like, well, so what would you do? And he says, well, we, we, we tried for three months to get the police to help us investigate. And find, they wouldn't. They wouldn't do anything. So finally, we had to get um, a court order. The judge had to write a court order making the cops investigate. And so he's like, hey, you want to see the investigation? I was like, yeah, sure. So he pulls out this piece of paper. And it's in like very flowery, totally ornate, uh, unnecessarily ornate Spanish. It basically, the investigation said in, in three sentences, yes, there is piracy at Grau. Right, uh, and then he's like, and then and then he's like, turn over the second page of it was a map, like a like a fourth grader would draw, uh, with a square that said Galerias Grau, in the middle, and then the names of the streets on the outside. That was the entire police investigation. So of course the CPL had to pay, and then he showed me the budget, which he should not have done. Um, and uh, you, you should never show a journalist your budget. The budget was really detailed and had, you know, they, they had to pay for the vests the cops wore that night that said like, you know, special task force or something. They had to pay for duct tape. They had to pay for new locks. They had to pay for video cameras. They had to rent the trucks. They had to hire the guys who were carrying the books into the trucks. They had to pay for the bags that the books were placed in. They had to pay for markers, I mean, everything. And then there was one line item that was, uh, about 20% of the budget that was labeled police honorariums. <laughs> and I was like, what's that? And I was like, is that a bribe? And he's like, oh, no, 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 that's not a bribe. That's uh, uh, incentives, is what he said. <laughs> um, so, I mean, the thing is, th his fear, th naturally, what, what, what the conclusion you come to is if, if you have to pay the cops to take books off the streets, then someone else can pay to get them out, right? And, uh, and so I, I asked him, at the time that I met him, with him, it had been about a month since the, the raid, and I was like, well, you know, what's gonna happen to the books? And he said, well, they're still counting them. Still counting them a month later. Um, and of course, if you, if you play with the official tally, then you, know, you, can, do, you can do a lot. And I said, so what's gonna happen? Well, you know, the, I'm, he said, I'm worried. The longer it takes, the more likely the worst case scenario is. And I said, well, what's that? And he said, well, he said, I bet my life that half of those books wind up on the streets again. Um, so let me read this last section about the, the culture, and then we'll have a few minutes to talk. I've seen limeños grind a coin between their molars. I've seen them crumple a paper bill, scratch it, smell it, hold it up to the light. These are all idiosyncratic methods of distinguishing real money from fake. Perhaps there are others. And when we discover we've been had, most of us frown, feel a tinge of anger, then mix it in with our real money to pass off on someone else. In Peru's more remote provinces where the present, uh, presence of the state is weak, no one knows for certain what legal tender is supposed to look like, or perhaps they don't care. I've been handed coins that resemble rusty bottle caps flattened beneath the heel of a boot and never had much trouble getting rid of them. We live immersed in a world of counterfeits. What's worse, we've come to accept it. This is the essence of what is known as la cultura bamba. Every limeño knows about a sangaro, that narrow downtown side street just behind the Palace of Justice, smelling powerfully of ink, where you can get a Harvard diploma, a business license, a European visa, or a national ID card printed up within minutes. How do you get there? Jump in one of Lima's 210,000 taxis, nearly 70% of which operate without the necessary legal paperwork. 
or maybe board a fake bus operating well-established routes in vehicles painted to look just like their authorized competitors. But along the way, be careful to avoid the real or staged construction sites. In May, I was teaching a class in North Lima, and every Saturday would come across the same half-block patch of broken road where two men in hard hats and orange vests carrying buckets and sledgehammers stopped traffic and asked for money. Fake city workers asking for funds to repair a road they'd most likely destroyed themselves. My taxi driver was unimpressed. In South Lima, he assured me, you could find roadblocks too. Only there, no one pretended to be working. And if you didn't give them a coin, they just broke your windows. When I was young, growing up in the United States, my family's periodic trips back to Peru usually included a suitcase filled with Reeboks and Levi's for my cousins. In a closed economy, decimated by war, the real thing was a rare prize. These were the early days of Peruvian piracy, when you might come across a pair of Mike sneakers or queso uh, wristwatch. The quality was laughable, and there was in an innocence to it that was almost moving. Counterfeiters toyed with logos but always gave themselves away. They were, after all, copying consumer products they'd most likely never seen. It is very different now. Counterfeiters are among Peru's most talented professionals and their economic impact is real. With each passing year, the technology improves and copies get closer to the original until the two are essentially indistinguishable. In the age of PDFs, photocopying an entire book is no longer necessary, though producing a readable volume that won't break the first time you bend the spine still requires some experience, skill, and most importantly, expensive machinery. One pirate I interviewed calculated that his workshop, which reprinted hardback academic texts by publishers like McGraw-Hill or Prentice Hall, had at least $30,000 worth of equipment. He complained to me that the newer pirates, less committed to quality, were forcing him to cut costs. In other fields, the cost of entry is not quite so high. Anyone with a $200 CPU can start pirating computer programs or digital music in a matter of minutes. In these, sector, in these sectors, the effect of counterfeiting has been catastrophic. The multinational video rental chain Blockbuster arrived in 1995 and was, for a time, thriving. Then in 2005, it saw its revenue drop 50%, and by the end of the following year, the company had fled Peru. Blockbuster was not killed off by internet downloads, but by local DVD pirates. I once met a drug-addled street kid with a runny nose and disastrously bloodshot eyes who told me he was saving up to rent a stand and sell pirated DVDs. With luck, he said, he would have the capital in just a few months. These are the small, tangible illusions the most helpless among us cultivate. It was midnight, and we stood in a wasteland beneath blown-out street lamps. There was trash everywhere, and the buildings were in such disrepair you could hardly tell if they were falling apart or had never been finished in the first place. Prostitutes roamed the streets, thieves. This boy would be sleeping there, dreaming of pirated DVDs. It's hard to quantify the cumulative cultural impact of all this rationalized dishonesty, nor is it clear how we arrived at this juncture. To be sure, the Fujimori regime was overwhelmingly corrupt, one after another. Journalists, judges, editors, businessmen, ministers, and opposition politicians were caught on video accepting bribes. It was a veritable parade of power brokers on the take, smug, cynical men stuffing their pockets with stacks of bills, joking aloud they couldn't carry it all. Perhaps, as Coronado argues, it's no coincidence that piracy exploded in those years, but it would be unfair to blame it all on Fujimori. Current president, Alan Garcia, is as depraved as greedy and as greedy as any of his predecessors, and having already failed as president once, this time around, he seems even less concerned with appearances. Last year, his entire cabinet resigned in the wake of a corruption scandal involving bribes and the sale of Amazonian natural gas exploration licenses to multinational firms. This should come as no surprise. The fact that the nation chose to give a known crook a second chance at the presidency says a good deal about the standard of ethics in Peru. In Lima, this is known as la criollada. Bending the rules and getting away with it has always been an admired skill and the gray area between right and wrong, between acceptable and unacceptable behavior is dismayingly vast and well-trodden. For better or for worse, this blithely codified cynicism has become our popular culture. One afternoon, over drinks, I was discussing all this with a friend of mine named Sergio. He's a writer and editor, and he told me he'd never bribed a police officer. I just don't believe in it. I know this isn't something to be proud of, he said, but in this country, and I congratulated him. Sincerely, I, for example, cannot make that same statement. 
but something had happened. A few weeks before, Sergio told me he was pulled over while driving in Miraflores. The cop wanted a bribe and was crude about it, vulgar and insistent. Sergio told him straight up, no pago coi, ma jefe. I don't pay bribes, boss. How did the officer react? Sergio laughed. He said, no need to get upset, son. Imagine, refusing to pay a bribe is interpreted as an aggressive act. Then the cop said, how can we work this out? This is role reversal. The common script has the civilian asking the police officer some version of that question. Sergio sipped his wine and shook his head. I should amend my previous statement, he said. I've never bribed a police officer with money. It turns out my friend was in a hurry. He had his principles, but this was taking too long. So what did you do, I asked. Sergio was embarrassed. I gave him a copy of my book. I had one in my trunk. He didn't believe it was me until I showed him the author photo. He was impressed. I even signed it for him, but he only agreed to take it after I convinced him it wasn't counterfeit. <laughs> it got dark around us. We kept talking, finished the bottle of wine, and then another, trying to decide if this anecdote was depressing or hopeful. So thank you. I'll take some questions now. Okay. Yes. Well, really kind of they are they are they are little family businesses. There's not necessarily a, a violent aspect to it. That I, I mean, I asked, you know, has any um, has anyone ever, you know, been like a brawl between people trying to control a certain corner? Um, it's it, 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 from, from my understanding how it functions is, uh, you know, someone controls the territory where you sell, and then the presses sort of make connections with the with the people who distribute them and uh, sometimes they'll have safe houses if you would call them that where they actually store the stuff near the points of sale um, so that if you watch a, a pirated a, a, a vendor you know at a certain corner at a certain you know at lunch break he'll go to a certain house and come back with new books you know um, to my knowledge there, there's there's not like the you know the violent aspect of like people shooting each other over the stuff um, but there is the corruption aspect of, of buying off cops and buying off judges, um, paying people to look the other way, um, paying to get books out, um, and uh, and and also you know people using aliases and and sort of having no fixed address and you know like unarrestable people. All that stuff is is sort of true. Yeah, in the back here. So uh, for all the parts you mentioned in the book are evident for Bruno because we see that we didn't have. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. What's the purpose of writing a book showing something that we already know exists? Um, that's a good question. I think uh, it it exists, and everyone knows it exists. And uh, and of course, you could write the same piece about DVDs, about clothes, about about everything. Um, in, in particular, I think what makes what makes books interesting is that. Uh, no one is against books. Everyone has a romantic notion of what books are and what books are supposed to be, and, and the, they have kind of hold this this special place in um, in the in not just Peruvian culture, but in any culture. Sort of the, the romantic idea of what the books represent. Um, so what what I was interested in, you know, everyone will probably, you know, if you twist their arm, admit to you that buying pirated DVDs at El Hueco is not good, you know. Uh, but no one will. Very few people are much more wishy-washy when it comes to books because they're like, well, you know, they're taking books to the masses and this and that, and, and to some extent they are. Um, so it just becomes a more complicated issue. I mean, I, uh, the reason why I wanted to write this piece was because because that makes it complicated because you're not talking about just the the informal economy and the transition from formal to infor to form from informal to formal economies, which is sort of the the, the one of the, from my point of view one of the main transitions that's happening in Peru and all over the developing world today. Um, but with this particular cultural item, which, which has so much, uh, so much weight, you know, and so much symbolic weight. So that was what I was interested in. Um, yeah, I don't know if that, I mean, it, it, it's, it's probably true that for a Peruvian, there's, there's, there might not be much here that they don't know. Having said that, no one's written a piece this long on it I, I don't, that I've ever read in, in Peru or anywhere. Um, you know, mostly because journalists don't have the time, and I had the luxury of time, you know, and someone paying me to do it. So, <laughs> if someone's gonna pay me to do it, I'm definitely gonna gonna do it. Um, yeah. Here. Do you think this is really working to the benefit of the masses? 
it's you know it's i went to you know i went to go buy my book and uh the, the first thing that when I, I went to go buy it on a street corner because the last day that i was in town literally the last day i was in town my editor called me and he said hey man i just saw your book i know you're writing this piece so maybe you should go buy it book had just come out this book of stories here um and i went and the thing that was so interesting was i was like hey man how much is books i walked up to him and the guy had never he always sells books to people in cars He's not selling books to people on a bus. He's selling books to people in cars. So if people in cars are buying them, then they're people with money, you know? So when I walked up to him, he was like, the hell? You know, like, I've never sold any, you know, it's just weird. And, and um, so clearly his target is not the masses, quote unquote, you know? Um, there are other things that you could argue are reaching the masses or at least responding to a need that formal publishers aren't. I mentioned that poet, uh, Luis Hernandez, uh, for example. Um, and that's an interesting case because he's a poet that people wanted to read. No publisher was interested in him. And so this, you know, vendor just made an edition himself full of mistakes and misspellings and errata like left and right. Nonetheless, it's an edition of a poet that was basically, uh, you know, kind of falling by the wayside, you know. Um, what the, what I, I don't know how to get books to the masses. I don't know. I don't know how people. You know, there's 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 really a lot of controversy as to how you would do that in a country like Peru. Um, the 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 pirates don't pay taxes. Obviously, they don't pay authors. They don't pay designers. They don't. You know, the only people they pay are the presses. So the people who make money all the time are the the people who own the presses. And a lot of times, the the fact that the presses will be making money off the formal publishers and the informal publishers because um, they're using the exact same presses to print their books up. Um, Peru has sort of programs like Promo Libro, which is uh, to promote reading and stuff. They, they have, you know, the, the literacy program I mentioned. Miserably funded, you know, and uh, miserably run and does basically nothing. Um, the National Library, uh, as I mentioned, from 1970 until about three years ago had no budget for acquisitions, you know, so it's clearly not a, a government priority to get books to people. Um, and even now their, their national, their acquisitions budget is something like $100,000 a year, which, you know, in a country 25 million people is, is nothing. And when you ask for your stats of like what national libraries are there, they give you these amazing statistics, but anyone in Peru knows there are no national, there's no national library system. There's no such thing. There's one building in downtown Lima, there's one in San Borja, I've never, I mean, that's all I know of. And even those books, to, to actually check out, a, I mean, you can't check out a book, you can go look at it, you know? So there's really, uh, there are a lot of real world obstacles between working class people and books. And the, the, you know, the pirates can make a legitimate argument that they're filling that space. Um, but they're also making money off uh, middle class people who are too cheap to buy real books. So they're, they're doing both at the same time, I think. Um, well, thank you, everybody, for coming. Thanks so much.